First off, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Yanmar Arena, formerly the IRA Civic Center. So if you haven't been here, uh, this is the newly remodeled project for the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, and it was opened up for the start of our hockey season last year. And it must have been a good thing because our hockey team last night uh, ended up beating Andover 3-2 in double overtime, so they're headed to the state tournament. Uh, we're here today, as I said, on a little more of a serious subject than the hockey games that have been going on here. But uh, in Grand Rapids, we have an issue, and it's regarding Legionella and our drinking water in the community. Uh, so today we're going to have some special folks up here to help us from the state of Minnesota and stuff. So I'm Dale Adams. I s currently sit on the Public Utilities uh, Commission. I'm one of the commissioners. And I've also been sitting on, for the last 18 years, I've been a member of the Grand Rapids City Council. So what goes on in Grand Rapids is certainly important to me, as well as the citizens of Grand Rapids. Now today, just a little bit about background on myself. Um, today we're here with, as I said, an important issue, and that's extremely important to me because uh, I think it was in November of last year, I was one of the, uh, at that time, 14 people that had had Legionella and it turned into pneumonia, and through the great opportunity to visit with our family docs and everything over at Grand Itasca, I worked my way through it. And it's a topic that really needs some discussion. And, and I just want to let the folks that are here know that this is something that's very serious with the Public Utility Commission of the City of Grand Rapids. And it's not an easy fix. We're going to we're gonna do what we have to, and we'll get through it. This afternoon, we're going to have three, three presenters. Tricia Robinson, an epidemiologist supervisor with the Minnesota Department of Health is here. She's going to be speaking right after me. Our general manager for the PUC, Julie Kennedy, is going to speak after that. And then Chad Seidel, the president of Corona Environmental. Uh, when it comes time, when the three presenters are done and it's time to go into question and answers, uh, Melissa Barr is going to be the one that will facilitate those, those question and answer sessions, and then there will believe, I believe there's going to be some breakouts uh, at the end, whether it's up here, back there, or where there's two or three sites that we'll have some, some breakout. So with that, let's get down to the ones that really know more than certainly than I know, and we'll start out with Tricia Robinson. So like you said, I'm Tricia Robinson. I supervise our Waterborne Diseases Unit at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I'm an epidemiologist. And uh, first of all, thank you all so much for having us here today. There are a number of my colleagues with the Minnesota Department of Health, both from our Drinking Water Protection Program, our Executive Office, and then of course from our Infectious Diseases Unit, or our Infectious Disease uh, Division, which is what I am a part of. But uh, my goal today is to give a little bit of background about Legionnaires' disease, and then about our investigation that has brought us to our point here today. So a little bit about Legionnaires' disease, just so we're kind of all on the same page. It is a serious type of pneumonia or a, back, a lung infection. It's spread by the water droplets in the air that contain Legionella bacteria, and people get sick if they breathe in water droplets that contain this bacteria. So people do not spread Legionnaires disease to other people, so if someone has it, they can't spread it to other people. Um, and you do not get infected from drinking or swallowing water. Uh, if somebody is going to is been infected with it, these symptoms usually begin about two to fourteen days after someone is exposed. So, what do these symptoms look like? Again, it's a very serious bacterial pneumonia, um, which might be symptoms like cough, shortness of breath, fever, muscle aches, headaches. And this um, is important to remember that there are people who are at greater risk or increased risk for Legionnaire's disease. Um, fortunately, most people who are exposed to Legionella do not get sick. Um, those who would be at greater risk, though, are people that are 50 years of age and older, current or former smokers, people with a chronic lung disease, um, people who may have a weakened immune system, and then people with underlying illnesses. And so I show this picture here, which is what we um, you know, would refer to as um, having kind of the picture of what we've had in the cases in Grand Rapids over the course of the last 10 years. And don't be um, 
confused a little bit because it only goes through July. And the reason why I'm showing this is to kind of set the stage of when we started to really investigate uh, this um, outbreak here in Grand Rapids. And so when we issued our first press release back in July, on July 19th, you can see that we had five cases here. That's the same number that we had seen over the previous 10 years here in Grand Rapids. And so that's why we were really concerned that we were seeing something out of the ordinary for us here in Grand Rapids. Um, you know, we had seen that one back in 2014, another one in 2017, one in 2020, and then two in 2022. Uh, but already in 2023, starting at the end of April and then through that middle of July, we had seen five. So how are people commonly exposed to Legionnaires' disease? Well, through things like shower heads and sink faucets, through cooling towers, which are um, really complex air conditioning units that contain water and a fan as part of the, an air cooling system, decorative fountains that may aerosolize the air, or hot tubs. And so um, as part of our investigation, we were looking for these uh, more common sources of infection. So thinking um, a little bit about our investigation here specifically in Grand Rapids. Again, we issued that press release uh, along with a health advisory on July 19th. And a health advisory is a communication that goes out to healthcare providers, and this one went out throughout the state to let them know that we were seeing this increase in cases in the Grand Rapids area uh, so that they could be on high alert to test anybody for Legionnaires disease that had symptoms of bacterial pneumonia um, so that uh, people could get prompt medical attention and treatment. People um, with symptoms of Legionnaires disease should contact their health care provider was that main message in this um, a press release. and. Along with that, again, we ask that healthcare providers watch for additional patients with symptoms that might indicate Legionnaires' disease. These recommendations continue to this day, and I think that's very important um, that people remember that, that we continue to uh, want to reiterate that people who have symptoms of Legionnaires' disease should contact, to contact their healthcare provider so that prompt uh, medical uh, treatment can be issued if needed. Again, as part of our investigation, we were looking for what the source might be. And um, as often can be the case in a community uh, cluster of illnesses or outbreak, um, that might be a cooling tower. So we were looking for any cooling towers that could potentially be the source. As part of that, we identified and sampled any potential cooling towers that were located um, within the vicinity of our cases. Um, one cooling tower did test positive for Legionella pneumophila, serogroup 1, which is the same type of Legionella as our cases, but it was very different from our case isolates. Um, and so that was not the source of our outbreak. Um, but as a preventive measure, that cooling tower was remediated um, to uh, you know, reduce any risk of any potential um, Legionella risk to the public. As part of this investigation, we did not identify any decorative fountains, any hot tubs, or other potential sources that could be the source of this outbreak. As is the case in any of our investigations, we interview cases to gather information on possible exposures um, that could help us identify the source. It became very clear to us that our cases were geographically clustered within the city. And um, on here, you'll see this outlined. We outlined this area on our press release that we recently issued. Um, but it is about a 1. Square, 1. 1.6 square mile area within the city. Um, for uh, data privacy reasons, we can't disclose the exact locations. Um, but this is a pretty tight um, area of the city, of course. And so no other common source was identified other than all of the cases did have exposure to the municipal water supply. Water sampling was conducted on December 12th, and along with this water sampling, we sampled buildings where more than one case had been exposed, as well as water storage facilities um, on the, as part of the utility system. Results of that were that samples from two buildings that were sampled were positive for Legionella. 
These samples were highly related to each other and to the Legionella bacteria that we had from patient respiratory samples by a technique that we have that's called whole genome sequencing. And that included a sample from an individual that was not in either of those buildings. Um, and this provided us the laboratory evidence to support the epidemiology evidence that we already had that the water supply is the source of this outbreak. This is a picture of an epidemic curve that shows uh, the outbreak to date of the cases by illness onset month. And as you can see, um, these cases started back in April. Again, this is by onset month, so when people became sick. And so as you can see, it's about one to two cases a month from April, with our latest cases becoming sick in January. So what are our recommendations for individuals in Grand Rapids? Again, as I stated before, to contact your healthcare provider right away if you develop symptoms of Legionnaire's disease. Again, this is a serious bacterial pneumonia consisting of cough, shortness of breath, fever, headache, um, and our, we do not recommend testing for people who may have been exposed but do not have symptoms. We have considerations for building owners. No matter where a building is located, building owners should always follow best practices for maintaining a healthy building water system. And so all building owners are encouraged to develop and implement a water management program if that is appropriate for their building. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have excellent resources on their website. Um, and I know that the water utility has excellent resource, or links to all of those resources on their website um, as to whether buildings would be um, appropriate for them to develop uh, a water management plan for them. And what about for homeowners? How can we help reduce the risk of waterborne diseases at home? Again, no matter where we're living, we can all take steps to help reduce our risk of waterborne diseases at home, including Legionella. And these can include things like regularly cleaning all of our devices that use water, um, always following our manufacturer's recommendations when using, cleaning, and maintaining water-related devices. If we have things like CPAPs or BiPAP machines, or neti pots at home, that we're using distilled water and not tap water in those devices. That we, that we clean our shower heads and our faucet aerators whenever we see buildup. If we see buildup, then it's important that we're cleaning them. And if on our hot water heaters, that we all have, um, that we set them to a minimum of 120 degrees. Uh, they can be set higher, and that can help reduce the risk, but it's important, especially if we have young children or elderly people in our homes, um, that we are cognizant of the fact that higher temperatures can um, cause scalding risk, and so uh, keeping that part in mind. It's also important that um, we keep in mind that all of these things will not eliminate the risk of Legionella at our homes. And that's why it's so important that we're having this partnership with the Grand Rapids Water Utility. Um, as part of this partnership, we have met with um, Legionella experts from CDC, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the University of Minnesota. And the Minnesota Department of Health has recommended that the Grand Rapids Water Utility hire a consultant with Legionella expertise to assess the distribution system, which they have, and they're here. And um, we are uh, really thankful that they have taken this recommendation and are following through on that. Um, I will say that this is a really long and complex process, and we would really hope that you will lend your support to the utility as they work through this process, um, and they do what's absolutely the best for all of you here in Grand Rapids. And I would also like to give a really big thank you to the city of Grand Rapids, um, to all of the great community members here um, who have helped us get to this point in our investigation. Um, a special thank you to the cases that answered our many questions, uh, sometimes multiple times, uh, for us to be able to identify the source of this outbreak. To the healthcare providers who, um, you know, have uh, helped us uh, get the isolates that we need and uh, have, of course, cared for the patients. Um, and to all of the different businesses that allowed us to collect samples 
and um, have helped us in identifying different things. And of course, to the water utility. And I'll hand it off to Julie. Thank you, Trisha. As Trisha alluded to, this is a complex uh, problem that we are addressing, challenge that we are addressing. And so I wanted to start just with a little bit of background into the water utility. Um, some people don't uh, sometimes know if their water is coming from utility or not. And so I wanted to do a little bit of a background on the Grand Rapids Public Utility Water System. And so with that, you can see we've got a groundwater system. You may have heard that in some of the information that has come out. We pull our water from five different wells. There are two different source aquifers, and those wells vary from 140 to 573 feet deep. Um, and so we're pulling very deep groundwater um, into that treatment plant. There's a picture at the top there of our treatment plant. In that treatment plant, we've got aeration, we've got filtration, We've got partial softening, but we don't have chlorination. Again, you've probably seen that in some of the customer letters that we've sent out as well. And we'll talk a lot about uh, with our, our consultants what that means. What does an undisinfected system mean? And what does that mean to our solution? Um, so knowing that our system is currently undisinfected um, is important to the solution here. And um, as we move forward then in the treatment plant, we've got a clear well. It's a 500,000 gallon clear well after the treatment plant that then pumps up to our three half million gallon towers. We've got three towers, one on the north that then feeds to the mid tower, that then feeds to the south tower on the south side of town. So you can see that with our map. Um, the, the water utility does not extend to all limits of the city jurisdiction. Um, but you can see here, for the most part, City of Grand Rapids proper is included. We've got about 81 miles of the distribution system. We usually pump about 1 million, just over 1 million gallons a day of water out of that treatment plant, and that provides the water to 3,300 customers, including the City of La Prairie. We're a wholesale distributor to the City of La Prairie, so they are our customers as well. Once that water hits the distribution system then, um, you can see on the left is a map of the blue mains. Those are water mains that are typically found in street or alley right-of-ways that carry the water from those towers into uh, the mains that then go to your service connections. Those are the purple lines that are on there. And so again, when we talk about a shared responsibility, I think this picture on the right really shows that. We are connected. The water that comes from those wells through the treatment plant to the towers, into the distribution system, and then into your um, service line, then go into your premise plumbing in your building. And so that is all one continued system. And so we have that shared responsibility from where we take that water from the well all the way to your shower and faucet and toilet. And so that, that when we talk about a shared responsibility, that's what we mean is we are completely connected um, in that system and that distribution. And so from our standpoint, I can't thank SPUD enough for coming forward. We've talked, this is extremely heartfelt. Our number one priority is providing safe water. And so I want you to know we are doing everything we can um, to make sure that we are providing the safe water that we can. So with that, you, as we said, we share that responsibility, but what are we doing on our side? From our side, all of the water that we deliver to you from the treatment system, from the distribution system, meets the federal and the state guidelines. You can see on the right is a, an excerpt or a page from our website. One of the regulations from the Department of Health in our public water supply is publishing annually our consumer confidence report, which is a water quality report that indicates what the standards are for our water distribution and treatment plant. Um, and so that historical information is on the website. As we begin to collect more information, and you'll hear that from Chad coming up with some of the additional efforts that we are doing, we will continue to publish that information on our website. It is there for you if you would like to go and see it. And so we want to assure you, again, the water is safe to drink. Just like Trisha said, it is, uh, Legionnaires is not uh, typically contracted from swallowing or drinking the water. Um, so assuring you that the water is safe to drink, but that we are looking into how we can help foster that um, safety at the, at the utility level. And so from our standpoint, um, in, in working with the utility level and Department of Health and how we fit in that organization, um, back in July, as, as Trisha talked about, there was that press release that came out. Um, and at that point, it wasn't tied to the distribution system and it wasn't tied to Grand Rapids Public Utilities, but they investigated with us. Do we know of any cooling towers? Do we know of anything in the area that may have changed? 
Um, and so we started um, talking with them then. And then in October, um, they notified us of their anticipated testing plan that was coming up. Just as, as Trisha mentioned, they were testing areas where there had been more than one case. They also wanted to test our facilities. Um, and so we provided a, a long list of information to the public water uh, or the public drinking water supply side of Department of Health, what had changed, if anything, in our distribution system, and anything to look for. And so then they came in December and did that testing, and we welcomed them. We sent staff with them to do that testing um, in December um, of our facilities, along with those two, two other commercial buildings that were tested. And then I had a meeting in January with, I think, 20 different experts on that, from EPA, CDC, University of Minnesota, Department of Health. Um, we got the results and started to say, now what, what's next? And so as, as Trisha alluded to, they encouraged us to look um, for a national consultant, somebody who specializes in that. Um, they gave us some references to be able to do so, and we're happy here today to provide Chad with Corona Environmental and his team. They came in on Wednesday, and they have been here with us from morning to night, solving um, all of the different things that we need to do our next steps. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chad and let him take, through, take us through what those are. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Tricia, for providing that introductory information. My goal is to add additional context and insight about what we have been learning along with the community and MDH about the concerns about Legionella in the water distribution system and as that moves into building systems and what can be done about it. So uh, Corona Environmental Consulting, we're a group of specialized engineers and scientists that address uh, concerning water quality issues, have done so across uh, many states, uh, including details with Legionella, supporting uh, federal and state regulatory agencies, municipal water systems, and then building water systems in the U.S. and internationally. And so I'm pleased to be joined by Jake Causey and Christian Matthews of our team here. Uh, also know Dr. Sheldon Masters, who has worked with us previously and now is a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, who worked on a key project that we led about communicating issues about Legionella is a part of our team too. But let me step into the understanding that we've been gaining with the information and insight that MDH and the community have developed so far. So both Tricia and Julie mentioned the sampling that happened in December, and the utility knows of the details associated with the locations that were sampled specifically uh, in their distribution system, including those shown on the map with the blue dots uh, listed on the left of the sample locations. And the result of those indicated that the samples uh, analyzed for Legionella again from the distribution system related system samples from the water utility, had two different types of results. First, absent with respect to culturing the organism, Legionella pneumophila, but positive with respect to the PCR analysis for Legionella species. We have many different scientific methods to assess these things, and those results are important to us. Now, having positive PCR results for Legionella species is not unexpected in a water distribution system, but it certainly bears witness to the need to look for more detail, uh, which is why we're investigating and moving forward in that way. Now, the bigger concern is really when you get to positive culturable samples, which, as Tricia said, was found in two of the building samples, and that is a concern. Those need to be addressed. Now, we're grateful for the collaboration that MDH and the community have moved forward with already with the University of Minnesota. Those collaborators were here in town on Monday and proceeded to take additional samples, further indicated on the map and listed on the left there, taking samples at the source of supply all the way from the north to the south, east to the west, and analyzing those with uh, even additional detail and methods to better understand the conditions both in the water distribution system and in some selected uh, locations as shown here. Now, those results will take on the order of two weeks for the more rapid analyses and perhaps as long as a little more than a month for the longer analyses to provide those results. And those uh, university collaborators at University of Minnesota are committed to providing those results. And as soon as they're available, uh, the utility is going to share those on the website and intend to provide the details of those and the context for what that means. Keeping those community details in mind, I want to share a little about what do we know about Legionella in water systems. 
And unfortunately, we don't know as much as we would like to know. Um, there are relatively few studies about how much Legionella is in water distribution systems as compared with Legionella in building and uh, case locations like um, cooling towers where we've had a very intentional investigation uh, history looking into those things in the US and internationally. Um, even less is known about that in undisinfected community water systems, which is a unique attribute of this community. Part of that is because of the way that the US drinking water regulations are put in place. So there are no federal or state requirements for disinfection of groundwater systems, uh, specifically unless you trigger some other things of concern. That has not been the case in this community water system, which has afforded the opportunity to continue to supply water uh, without applying disinfection. Further, there's no national guidelines to help water systems collect and analyze and report samples for Legionella, which I and others of our colleagues have been working with EPA over the last number of years to help improve upon that understanding. And uh, in fact, there was a National Drinking Water Advisory Council report just this last fall that provided additional detail on that front to help move that forward. So a little bit more, I can at least tell you where we're pushing in this way within the national drinking water community to understand. And so the current ongoing research of this subject is very informative. Just in the last two years, um, the Water Research Foundation, an organization that many of us are a part of supporting, uh, kicked off a research project led by good friends and colleagues of ours to investigate specifically what is the occurrence of Legionella species and Nemophila in drinking water distribution systems. They enlisted 55 volunteering water utilities across the country. There are a couple of which that are in Minnesota. Those are anonymous for the purposes of the research efforts, but we do know that there are two in the state. They cover a wide array of water systems, small water systems, large water systems, served from groundwater supplies and surface water supplies. But I will note, all of them are disinfected with either chlorine or chloramine. So that's free chlorine is just the addition of chlorine. Uh, chloramine is the addition of chlorine and ammonia. And both of those disinfection practices are used across the US, certainly here in the state of Minnesota, and are part of the conversation about how the utilities will move forward in this case as well. So each of those water utilities signed themselves up for collecting two samples per week for 12 weeks uh, during two summers, these last two summers, uh, during the warm water months. And out of those results that have been most recently shared, and they're working on the publication of this right now, and as soon as it's available, we'll work to make it publicly available to everybody. Um, they collected more than 8,000 samples. So keep in mind how many samples have been collected in the water distribution system here. We're approaching about 10 to 20 now. They've got 8,000 results nationally from these 55 water systems. And of those, a little more than 1% have been positive for Legionella pneumophila, the species of Legionella that is of greatest concern for causing Legionnaire's disease. Now, those have been experienced, positives have been experienced in 15 of the 55 water utilities, a little bit more than a quarter. So what that then means, underlying the data, suggests that not all utilities experience it, those that do don't experience it everywhere, and they don't experience it all the time. As compared with places where we have experienced Legionella concerns in buildings, where when there's a concern, you typically see it, and you see it in a lot of places, and you work to remediate it, similar to the cooling tower example that Trisha shared earlier. Now, how does this implicate what we do next here in Grand Rapids? We're uh, moving forward with really important attributes on two fronts. The first is a much more detailed investigation and sampling. We are going to instigate further sampling at more locations with greater frequency over time to look specifically for Legionella pneumophila and other water quality parameters that help inform the concern of if it is present or not throughout the water distribution system. So the map here is yet another map with more blue dots of places that the water utility is already collecting samples for some of the current regulatory requirements. We're going to add Legionella sampling to those locations, and we also want to enlist volunteers that would be willing to make available locations within your buildings 
to sample alongside. So we can answer questions about both the distribution system and buildings in particular and be able to address those in the most meaningful way. That's important for the immediate response to Legionella concerns, but it's also important for informing this other prong of our response, which is developing, uh, planning, and implementing disinfection for the water system. Grand Rapids is one of the two large water systems serving greater than 10,000 people in the state of Minnesota that is undisinfected. Uh, and there are more than 200 water systems in the state that are not disinfected, but the vast majority are smaller. But we're gonna work through what it will take to implement disinfection with a very deliberate consideration of what that means for addressing the Legionella concern, as well as the other things that are implicated when adding disinfectant. So there's implications for customers that use water in their businesses, whether it's disinfected or undisinfected, that need to be communicated and addressed. There are other regulatory considerations when applying a disinfectant that we will address. And we've already started putting in plans, collaborating with utilities and their other providers uh, to test those things and report back internally with MDH, with other experts outside of that, as we, lifted, as we listed before and ultimately with the community. So the community can together come to an outcome that meets the best needs going forward. You're gonna hear a lot uh, from the community as this moves forward with continued uh, and deliberate transparent communication about what's going on. Which is what the next slide says. Yet another reiteration of the website. There will be continued additions to the website with results of testing with recommendations for things that uh, building and homeowners can do with plans to be implementing sampling and disinfection. And we do anticipate there will be future community meetings where we will be engaging uh, you all in helping answering questions and concerns and charting that path forward to successfully address this issue going forward. So as we wrap up here, I wanna just reiterate, there are things that can be done right now by all of us. Utilities is working on the things that they can be doing within their distribution system, and customers can do things in their own homes and businesses as well. One of the most important things for addressing Legionella is keeping the hot water hot and keeping the cold water cold. Legionella prefer to grow in temperate water temperatures. So under 120 degrees, is pretty ideal for them. Really cold coming out of the groundwater, not ideal to them. So they need a, a modest warm temperature to be able to grow, survive, and proliferate. Above 120, they're not active, and above 140 degrees Fahrenheit, it can actually be inact inactivated thermally, just like one would consider like in a typical uh, boil water condition. So those are important considerations, but as Tricia said, that cannot be done without accounting for the scalding risk. You have to have appropriate management of your fixture so you can keep the hot water hot, but then when you deliver it at the faucet or at the bathtub or at the shower head, it isn't so hot that it's a concern for scalding. Also important to flush devices as necessary, so home hot water heaters can have the need to be flushed. Follow recommendations for doing that if you have any accumulation and buildup of sediment. And then all the other things that have been mentioned before, clean shower heads and faucets, maintain humidifiers and hot tubs, and uh, even water filters themselves need to be addressed and maintained following those manufacturer recommendations. You can stay up to date with other provisions and recommendations of those things with the website as we mentioned before. Um, and with that, that concludes the technical aspects of this and we're glad to shift to the moderated question and answer expect that you have some questions that hopefully we can best answer here. And for those that might be watching this in a recorded version in the days and weeks to come, they can benefit from the questions that you ask here as well. And we'll work to continue to post these answers to the website uh, for those that haven't been able to participate today. So with that, I'll conclude and welcome you all. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, my name is Melissa Barr, and I'm the president of the Chamber of Commerce, and we lie right directly in the middle of this area that's been defined. So I have just as much interest in learning, and certainly you can use my building if you'd like to test water. Um, we want to make sure that is helpful. But thank you for coming. It's a beautiful Friday for sure, so thank you for giving us your time. Um, a couple of things. We will have two ways to ask questions. This is a public meeting, so it is being videotaped. And for some people, that's uncomfortable to ask questions. 
And so we will have a large group question and answer period now. If you'd like to wait, there will also be some small groups that are available with most of it, with both the Minnesota Department of Health and also uh, the Corona Environmental, is that right? Okay, yeah. it, they will also be at the table. So you will get um, your information answered and all the information at the tables will be the same. It's not gonna be different. And I would encourage folks to ask your questions here. Don't get it on social media. Please don't get it on social media. Um, please ask your questions here and go to trusted sources. So with that, I would just like to lay a couple of ground rules. One, this is a public meeting that will be videotaped. So just be conscious of what you're saying, that that will come out. And then um, leave it to about two to three minutes and we make sure everybody gets through and gets their questions and you can come through again if you have another question that comes up. And I would just ask you to be kind. Be kind to each other. Please don't say negative things about employees or staff. Um, that I will, call, I will call to an end and we will move forward. So I'm just going to lay just a few ground rules that I'm sure your mother or grandmothers have laid out before. Um, nothing new. Do I have anybody who's willing to go first if you have some questions? Not everybody has to jump up. I didn't mean to scare anybody. I can ask. I'll start. How's that? When I was sitting there, I had one. So what about diffusers? You know, a lot of people have diffusers that have essential oils, and they come up, and they're on desks and in homes. And what does that look like? I'll effectively reiterate what Tricia was describing. The means of being infected by Legionella bacteria is aerosolized water droplets containing the bacteria being breathed into your lungs. So any means that would do that has the possibility of being a pathway for that infection. So oil-based diffusers that have water could be of concern. We, I listed humidifiers, um, other things that are more prevalent in the summer months in hotter areas would be misters over patios. Um, any number of those that could be of concern would need to be uh, addressed in a meaningful way. So those are things that, as we're working through uh, addressing the concern about this, would be advisable to not use tap water for those applications. The question is related to hot tubs. And if you have all the right chemicals in that hot tub, is there something that they should be concerned about? Did I get that right? Or is that okay? Yeah, so I would just reiterate the importance of maintaining that hot tub appropriately and always maintaining those chemicals. And Sounds like you're doing just that. Thank you. My name is Joe Barrick. Um, I'm wondering, Chad, um, when you were sort of warning us that this was going to take a while, is there any way that you can give us a, uh, an approximation? Months? Years? Glad to speak to it. Yeah. Yep. And one more real quick question. Are saunas a potential culprit? We have a lot of those around here. Say again. Saunas? Is that a potential issue? Let me, <laughs> Thank let, you. Me, let me start with the time frame. Great question about the time frame. Um, so we're going to be instigating the sampling and investigation effort with distribution system and uh, intending to enlist volunteers for building sampling as soon as possible, really within the next week or two is the expectation given the delivery of supplies and the uh, laboratory connections that need to be made. So that will be happening very quickly. Results from those are likely to be coming in about the same time or shortly thereafter after the University of Minnesota round of samples that were collected on Monday will. So should be anticipating results certainly within a month and then a continued frequency of reporting results as those are continued to be sampled over time. Now the implementation of disinfection starts with planning. That planning is on an unbelievably fast track right now to assess the different options for uh, applying disinfection to the water system. There's two approaches that can be used, as I mentioned, either chlorine or chloramine. They each come with different benefits and challenges. And we are going to work through that with the water utility, with uh, MDH drinking water program, folks from EPA and CDC, as we work to answer the critical questions about what will be best for the short term and for the long term. Our commitment is that the initial aspects of that plan will be done certainly within a, in a two to three month process. That's the plan. There are questions as to whether or not the plan will lead to an outcome of implementing it immediately 
or implementing it later on in the year, depending upon the concerns about Legionella exposure from the temperature aspects that are out there. So those are things that are gonna be forthcoming and we're gonna inform those based upon the expertise of folks involved here and other experts outside of that. So um, the other thing to note is when disinfection is added to the water system, note that as soon as it starts being added at the water treatment plant and perhaps at other locations throughout the distribution system, it will take time for that disinfectant residual to permeate the system and make its way all the way to every tap being used in the community. And that's because the water system has not been experiencing disinfection since it was constructed, which means there are other surfaces in the distribution system that will consume that disinfection residual. And so over time, it will overcome that and ultimately release it or reach those, those points. That's why the monitoring program initially is so important to inform the effectiveness of that, impl that implementation and confirm that it's achieving the intended uh, objectives. Now, I think I need to pass the, the mic to the question about saunas. Is that something? Saunas. Oh, saunas. Saunas, definitely. <laughs> Wet saunas, for sure, yes. are of concern. Um, would need to be addressed in a way where you are confident that the hot water system applying to that is greater, certainly than greater than 120, but I'll tell you, in the medical context, where we've been engaged in hospital environments, we have to be even more particular that those hot water systems are maintained at and above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously, those systems are different for scalding concerns. And so, saunas require a, a, a specific detail attention and would need to be addressed in a way um, that meet the manufacturer recommendations under those conditions. My name is Kelly Chandler and I'm a Grand Rapids resident and own a couple businesses in town. One actually is in the map, so, which I honestly did not put together until this moment <laughs> and I should have. Um, so I'm incredibly happy that we're actually making some progress on understanding where this um, disease came from. Um, but my question, this is not a cooling tower issue, but a question that we have had is, if it wasn't a cooling tower in our downtown business area, how far would that travel in the air? Since we have experts here, I thought, hmm, let's ask that question because we were wondering it um, when we first heard about Legionnaires in our community. Happy to answer that. So typically we would think that that could be up to about a mile, um, but it doesn't mean that there's something magical that it couldn't be a little bit more than that. Um, we have had outbreaks not in Minnesota, but in other parts of the country where it has been a little, where we have seen that drift a little bit further than a mile based on those conditions. Um, but again, if people do have cooling towers, um, again, we would really reiterate the importance of kind of all devices that people are properly maintaining them and having a water management plan for the cooling towers and taking good care of those. So when you, when you think about testing, are you thinking about just the businesses or is it businesses and residential? Like what, what are you thinking when it comes to testing? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Our uh, intent is to broaden the sampling beyond just the water distribution system to include a wide array of buildings that are kind of corresponding to the diversity of locations across the system that the water utility can access from their, their system. So it could be homes, it could be businesses. Clearly access to a business is perhaps a little bit more straightforward for water utility staff, but if you're willing and able to provide access to your homes for that purpose, we would welcome that. So we encourage folks interested share your information about that and we'll be working through how we solicit that information more specifically from which we'll down select to the ones that fit the best needs of the sampling program and share that now that means different things for different people especially when it comes down to reporting results and so i think it's important to note that if you sign up for that we would want to be able to clearly communicate samples are being collected there and what the results are of that so a part of this will be the education of what will it look like if you take a sample and it comes back with a positive result? One that is perhaps of concern or some that perhaps are not of concern and how we walk through that together. So there's a number of steps will be coming. That information is going to be forthcoming on the, on the utilities website. Yeah, thank you. So Rob Hengel, um, uh, if it's traveling in the piping system, 
and it's like let's say coming down here and the disease is here does it travel back up the pipe or is it just flush out and then that brings me to summer sprinkling systems if we start sprinkling our water we're sending the water into the air is that you're saying it's all in the air so, there you go great questions so again, the means of being infected by Legionella bacteria is by water droplets making their way into your lungs. So sprinkler systems can be implicated for that, although the risk analysis around those um, doesn't show to be as high of a risk as others that were identified before, shower heads, faucets, even, even toilets in some cases are implicated. And so it's important to address this in all the water supply to your homes. Um, your earlier question about where does it come from and how does it get to places, keep in mind Legionella bacteria generally, so all the species, they're naturally occurring organisms that we can find in a lot of environments. Legionella pneumophila is the one that we're specifically concerned about, about its infectious uh, properties for causing Legionnaire's disease. I'll spare you the additional layers of details that go well beyond that. If you're interested, ask later, um, but those, can be found in surface water supplies, in lakes, in rivers, in groundwater wells. And we know the, that to be the case because of the sampling that has been done um, internationally and here in the US. If it makes its way into a distribution system, this isn't like a discrete thing that it just gets there and it follows its way all the way from point A to point B. Because they can stop along the way, they can be killed off for any number of reasons because of temperature or disinfection or other reasons. And there's other things uh, in water supply. We, we do a lot of things to protect water systems through what we call a multi-barrier approach. So you've got source water protection around, around your groundwater wells. You have the various treatment steps through your treatment process. You have your distribution system where we maintain positive pressure to keep things from coming into the pipes. We're okay with some water leaking out of the pipes, but it's not good to have things leaking into the pipes. And the same goes for things in your, in your home. So there's backflow prevention. All those things are meant to prevent things from getting into the system. But acknowledging that these things can get into water systems, they then can be able to find conditions where they can grow and proliferate. We use the term amplification. And so generally we want to identify opportunities where these bacteria could amplify. And that is in stagnant water that is in the temperate zone and then with no disinfection. And in those cases, it can lead to amplification and then you get higher concentrations of those bacteria. And then if it's aerosolized, it increases the risk that it can be infectious. So back to the, can it move back and forth in a water system? Generally, we wouldn't expect them to be swimming upstream. However, um, it's, it is certainly possible that there could be uh, those bacteria at different points of the distribution system and they can detach from the wall and go downstream and they could get to a place perhaps it's better conditions to grow and proliferate and then detach from the wall and go further downstream. So that's a, a generalized picture of what that is, but that's one of the reasons why moving ahead with the protective measures of investigating the distribution system for concerns considering and implementing disinfection will bolster the way to mitigate the risks of those things being at concentrations that could be more likely to cause infection via those routes. Last thing I'll say is we do not have an expectation that water distribution systems are sterile environments. You would not want that water coming into your house. We have to do what we can to acknowledge and mitigate those risks and keep things in check. Um, certainly for Legionella. And so that's why there's this objective of water system does what it does to deliver that water successfully to you. People in their homes and businesses use that water effectively going forward. And as a community, we can solve this together. I'm Amber Merrick. I'm a homeowner in town, um, engineer. So I'm always really interested in the root cause and the risk analysis. And, and so I trust that the chlorine chloramine, you've got that part under control. I'm actually interested in the opposite. Um, you said there were 200 other towns in the state that don't treat. I, I'm curious to know what the differences are between us and them. Other than size, is there anything about our source water 
that could be changed closer to the source rather than midpoint where we introduce a chemical to manage it, or is it purely size driven? I think I understand your question. Do you need me to change it? No, I'll, let, let me start. <laughs> I, so for context, I did just this morning run through the inventory of Minnesota water system characteristics, and if MDH wants to comment, this, comment on this from the public water supply, just to understand what is the, uh, what are the demographics of water systems in the state of Minnesota, and how are they uh, using disinfection, not disinfected chlorine or chloramine, and of course, I don't remember the exact details off the top of my head, but and I don't know how far I want to go into the nuances of this because there's, what, 6,500 regulated water systems in the state, roughly, of which just less than 1,000 are community water systems. So the rest are non-community systems. Um, but of the community water systems, of those, my recollection is there's a, just over 200 that are not disinfected, and of those, the vast majority are small, serving fewer than 500 people. So the key thing to note about undisinfected groundwater supplies is that, again, the federal drinking water standards and the way that uh, Minnesota implements them as the privacy agency affords that opportunity, provided the water is, uh, has, has appropriate source water protection around the groundwater wells themselves, and they're not experiencing any coliform results in the distribution system indicative of bacteriological concerns. If you do have those concerns and you trigger those actions, then other attributes of the Drinking Water Act then require disinfection in different ways, either at the wellhead itself or, uh, and or in ways to maintain a disinfectant residual into the system. So as long as the source is clean and can be maintained effectively to the distribution system, not disinfecting water systems is still, uh, you know, an allowable practice in the U.S. and certainly in Minnesota. So we've triggered, we've triggered a point where it must be disinfected then by. No, no in, in fact, there is no legal requirement for. That's a great way to thank you for proposing it. That way. So that there is no legal requirement federally or in the state that under current conditions is requiring Grand Rapids to implement disinfection. So that's part of that deliberative process that we're going to go through right now to assess the best way to address and mitigate concerns for Legionella, along with all the other things that uh, comes with supplying safe, affordable, reliable water to the community each and every day. Um, our very initial precursory view of the information suggests that, yes, adding disinfection will be a benefit to the community in a number of different ways, certainly Legionella being chief among them given the current conditions. And so um, there's a lot of attributes of that that will be forthcoming as we work through that analysis and share it with the community. So glad to have anybody else answer that as you wish from MDH and others, but uh, lots more of that conversation to come in the weeks to come. I have my encouragement also with the infectious disease epidemiology division. With Patricia, and you asked a great question about the, kind of the root cause and stuff. And so it's, it's not really the source water Legionella can be found almost anywhere at low levels in, in source water. It just becomes a problem when that somewhere in the distribution system of the pipes, the right conditions exist for, as Chad explained, for the Legionella to kind of grow up to the level where it can cause um, you know, infections in, in humans. And so, so that's really what, what's happening here is we're going up somewhere in the system and then periodically through disturbances in the system or whatever, you know, the little bits of odds or however to characterize it kind of get thrown off and, and then ends up in people's homes or um, or buildings. And so that's I think the Chad and Chad's group in the community are kind of working to identify how to, how to rectify that. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, Americans now consume 300 to 600 times the amount of chlorine that is safe to ingest. So, is chlorine in drinking water dangerous? Because when chlorine mixes with even minute amounts of organic compounds that are very often found in water, they produce harmful products called trihalomethanes. 
These byproducts produce free radicals in the body, which trigger cell damage, and they are highly carcinogenic in even the smallest amounts. So scientists have looked into the potentially dangerous effects of chlorine. Use of the chemical has been linked to a wide range of ailments, including various cancers, reproductive problems, problems with the immune system, and even heart attacks. So I would like to find out if that's the best way to treat our water. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for posing that question. So you raise uh, some of the underlying reasons for our deliberate assessment of how uh, and with which means to implement disinfection in the Grand Rapids uh, water distribution system. Um, what you state is correct. Adding chlorine to drinking water with organic carbon, uh, we, we measure it as total organic carbon or dissolved organic carbon, does form disinfection byproducts. And disinfection byproducts are, there's an array of, of them, some of which are of greater and less concern for public health. Those are long-term carcinogenic risks, chronic risks, as compared with the more acute risk of bacterial infection like pneumonia or other microbial concerns that we use disinfection to address. And so the way that the US EPA and agencies like MDH as primacy agencies in implementing drinking water programs describe it is a balancing act between mitigating the acute risks of bacterial and microbial contamination with disinfection while also minimizing the exposure to long-term risks or chronic risks like disinfection byproducts. And so our deliberate approach will absolutely be assessing those things and acknowledging the fact that there are some trade-offs made in that, but to the betterment of the overall public health for the community. So those are things that will be clearly shared in the analysis that we'll put forth. I'm glad to point you to additional resources that help describe that and what that means uh, for you uh, specifically and for your community. And, and no, we will have to monitor for those things. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. So as a water system is disinfected, so those, those consumer confidence reports that Julie showed on the website will have more things to report as a part of implementing disinfection. So you can know what those will look like. And actually, um, those details are important uh, along with a number of other aspects of maintaining safe water supply. The question really is about if we, if we put chlorine and chlorination into the water, is it, a, is it there forever? Or can it be kind of a short-term solution uh, as we look forward? And so, did I say that right? Like kind of that. <laughs> I'm not here. <laughs> Both interim and permanent applications of disinfection are going to be investigated and assessed. Um, I don't know that I can effectively speculate about it right now uh, because the time and effort an intention to implement disinfection to make it effective on an interim basis is almost the same as doing it on a permanent basis. And this part, that's why that monitoring program is gonna be so important to help us understand where are the concerns and how is disinfection and other means to mitigate concerns in the distribution system achieving the end results of decreasing potential risk. And so, Short of, I can't give you a confident answer right now, but tell you that we're going to look at all aspects of remediating and addressing this issue going forward. And certainly short-term uh, implementation of disinfection is on the table. Long-term is also on the table, not just for Legionella, but for other aspects and concerns for the water system. So uh, in all likelihood, it's a long-term implementation, but because of the unique natures of this uh, distribution system, we have to investigate it a little bit more further to give you confident answers. So we have a lot of folks who leave in a typical winter when it's cold, it doesn't look like this. Um, but they come back, right? So they've been sitting, their house has been sitting, nobody's, the water isn't circulating, it's sitting in the pipes. Is that one of the risks? And, and if it is, like, what should they do when they come back? Or if somebody has a spare room that they never touch? Like, what can they do? Very good question. Thank you for prompting that question. 
particularly in communities with high degrees of seasonal use. So flushing building systems after stagnation is really important. And so one of the things that happened, one, I, I feel like it's a bit of a stretch to say one of the good things that came out of our experiences of the COVID pandemic was learning and researching and demonstrating the value of and importance of flushing in buildings after stagnation. So there are a few really good um, reference guides for how to implement that with both CDC, um, again, the Water Research Foundation, and uh, some of our research colleagues at both Purdue University and uh, Virginia Tech. And so thank you for noting that. We will be uh, deliberate to add a section to the website that details those. Some of that is the really, really detailed technical la language, and some of it is like the one or two pager that says this is what you do. Simple answer though, if you have not used a fixture, I would say even more than a week, run it on the cold and then run it on the hot at the hot temperature, I'm trying to remember the exact guidance, minutes. Like we're talking five to 10 minutes in most cases of most of the guidance that's out there, yeah, 10 minutes um, before use. And there's other guidance around that about ventilation when you're doing that. So it's not like you want to cause, how do I say, sauna. You don't want to cause a sauna in your bathroom when you do that. You want to make sure it's effectively ventilated as you're doing that to mitigate those concerns over stagnation. So that's, that is a really great question to ask and we'll, we'll endeavor to get those details uh, more more uh, predominantly shown <laughs> on, the, on the website. The question was, will water distributed water are they the same? And I see yeah. everybody's nodding, yes, <laughs> yes, pay attention, it's the same. Yep. It's, it's the same. Any other questions? There will be an opportunity. So if you'd rather work in small groups and ask in small groups, there will be a table in the back, there will be a table up here in the front, and the stick. So there's three spaces. Find a table if you want to visit. There will be experts sitting at that table to answer more of your more of your questions, or if you have concerns, to share those as well. So please feel free to do that, and I will let Julie conclude. Yep. Thank you, Melissa, for hosting that for us, Marina. Thank you all for coming and your great questions. Questions that. I should have even thought of um, that are great. Are we mandated to do this? No, I, I hadn't even thought about that question being asked, so thank you. Um, but this is something that we are committed to do. Um, these are friends and family. These are people that live here with us every day. Uh, and so we are committed to doing what's right, whether it's mandated or not. Um, and so we're appreciative for uh, the partnership with the Department of Health and their guidance in the epidemiology and infectious disease, along with the public drinking on our side, as well as our consultants. We've got both Lynn Mink and Corona here with us in for the long haul. This is not a solution, as you heard today, that we are, are going to be able to be done next week or next month or even next year. Uh, these are long-term decisions that we are making here, so, and, and we're making them methodically for the very point that we are concerned um, about the balancing the effects of those acute um, challenges that we have now with the long-term. And so thank you for coming. Please stay tuned to the website. Stay tuned. Our commission meetings are posted on ICTV as well. Um, we have those uh, that are out, and we are linking to those. If you have any questions, I believe my contact information is up there. Certainly reach out, and we will get you to the right people. So thanks again for coming, we sure appreciate it. Thank you.